Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today on this snowy morning. Hopefully everybody's doing well after our blizzard. Um, my name is Tawny Simiski. I'm the entomology specialist with UMass Extension's Landscape Nursery and Urban Forestry Program, and I'm excited to welcome you all today to our Invasive Insect Webinar Series. Um, this program is brought to you by a collaboration between the Landscape Nursery and Urban Forestry Program and UMass Extension's Fruit Program, and it is made freely available thanks to funding support through the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So we are very grateful for that funding. Just a quick reminder about pesticide and association credits before I introduce our first speaker today. Um, for those of you who are interested in receiving those credits, all instructions uh, for Massachusetts categories 25, 27, oops, 29, 35, 36, 48, and applicator's license, as well as association credits uh, will be shared at the end of this webinar. So please remain on the webinar until the very end to receive in these instructions. It is also important for folks, especially if you are interested in receiving pesticide credits, to answer any poll questions that are shared during today's presentations. Uh, answers to those will not be graded, but you must complete the poll questions in order to receive credit. Uh, additionally, if you sign off the webinar early or without answering these poll questions, you will not be awarded pesticide credit. And then finally, I've uh, added this in the chat, but I will send it again for those of you who are just uh, joining us now. Uh, due to the fact that UMass Extension is a recipient of federal funding, we do have a requirement to ask a few questions about demographic information, specifically gender, race, and ethnicity. This survey is 100% voluntary and also 100% anonymous, uh, so please consider uh, filling this out. And again, the link to fill out this survey will be sent again in the chat momentarily. Uh, being that the survey is voluntary, you can skip either the entire survey itself or any questions that uh, you feel uncomfortable answering. And uh, we will not collect any identifying information or other information that would allow us to link your responses uh, to this survey with your participation in this program. So again, it is anonymous. Okay, so with that, I do want to start uh, giving control uh, of the, here we go, hold on the screen, to our first presenter. And Ryan, you should get that prompt shortly. And while he's getting yeah. his screen set up, I will introduce uh, Ryan Vasquez, who is the Program Director of USDA APHIS PPQ's Asian Longhorn Beetle Cooperative Eradication Program for Massachusetts. And today he will provide us with uh, some updates from the Massachusetts Asian Longhorn Beetle Cooperative Eradication Program. So thank you so much for speaking, Ryan, and uh, have at it. All right, thanks, Tony. Good morning, everyone. And uh, in addition to updates on Massachusetts, uh, Mass Massachusetts program, I'm going to include uh, some brief updates on Ohio, New York, and uh, a little bit of time spent on South Carolina, as I'm sure everyone is interested in what's going on down there. Um, okay, I'm going to probably cut out the video for the sake of connection um, momentarily. Okay, Tony, are we good? Yep, looks great. Go ahead. All right. And uh, usually we try to get a group photo every year. Um, this one's from actually 2019, uh, you know, pre pandemic. This is, uh, we're hopefully going to get another one <laughs> this upcoming year with luck. Okay. There we go, sorry, technical difficulties. So, um, gonna run through some a brief update about ALB in general. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing many of you at this point are familiar with Asian longhorn beetle and probably have seen quite a, uh, quite a few of the slides I'll be sharing, but for the sake of folks that may not be familiar, um, brief background. Uh, ALB was first detected in New York in 1996 and uh, eventually, uh, Illinois, New Jersey, Canada, 
uh, here in Massachusetts, um, Ohio and South Carolina, ultimately South Carolina uh, this past year. Uh, it has been declared eradicated in uh, portions of Canada, in Illinois, in New Jersey, portions of New York, and for us in Massachusetts, uh, Boston, there was a satellite infestation which uh, lasted for about four years. We'll get into that uh, in a few slides. And, uh, you know, what we see with Asian longhorn beetle and with many pests, as you know, um, on dunnage, woody material, um, many times can be a pathway for the insect to make it uh, into the country. And this is a photo from New Jersey. Uh, we didn't actually have one from Massachusetts at the time, but it was a very similar scenario where there was a uh, factory that had thousands of pallets stored up behind its property. And you could suspect that uh, the infestation occurred around there. That's where some of the oldest uh, infestation was found in Massachusetts and Worcester, our uh, suspected mother tree, as well as some other very old infested trees were found in that area. And uh, yeah, the economic damage, as, um, as everyone may know, uh, especially in this area, tourism, the sugar maple industry, timber industry, nursery stock, so on and so forth. And um, it's gonna be interesting in South Carolina to see what, uh, what else it would affect. Um, I think it's gonna be a different, couple of different scenarios down there and to be determined. The life cycle, what we observe in the Northeast is that the insect develops on a two to three year life cycle. Uh, I think in Massachusetts, Worcester, we've seen two year life cycle. Um, that's that seems to be pretty common. If you get it, if you get further north, uh, when it gets uh, pretty cold, we've seen potentially a three-year life cycle, and uh, further south, maybe even one. Um, I don't think we need to spend too much time on this one. And the host trees, uh, twelve host genera. It's gone back and forth a couple of times. We've um, removed hackberry. We've also added uh, golden rain tree. But uh, these, these are the major ones, um, the pref preferred ones that we see. And just a slide, possibly a couple slides of some damage. Uh, you can see here some fresh egg sites, that lighter tan mark, those tan marks, those are the uh, probably recent of that year uh, taken, probably laid right before this photo was taken. Uh, over position sites along with some of the older ones where you can see the cracking uh, occurring in the bark. And you can see some frass on top of that branch uh, as well. And that is a pretty heavily infested tree and you don't always find them that way. But when you're in the uh, initial core or you know, us responding to, generally when a homeowner finds an infested tree, it's not just a couple, they find, their, they find a tree that's heavily infested. This is what you're gonna see. And this is another tree uh, from New Jersey. It had approximately 800 exit holes on it. And uh, we did see similar trees in Worcester, in the Greendale area at the time. Unfortunately, we did not have photos of those until those trees were down. Hindsight is 2020. The urgency was to, to process that material. But that uh, quote unquote mother tree was a sugar maple and it looked very similar to this. And I believe it also had a similar number of exit holes on it. But I'd like to include this slide to, uh, to show people that ALB left unchecked can kill a tree and we'll keep reinvesting it until that tree is dead. Might not work as quickly as some other pests, but it, uh, it'll get there. So the history of the Massachusetts infestation, we touched on this a bit, but it was first confirmed in 2008 in the Greendale Burncoat neighborhood. We've been working diligently since then. It was uh, estimated that at the time of discovery, it had been established or present for about 12 to 15 years. In Boston, the tree, uh, the first tree was found by a uh, groundskeeper on the property who had recently uh, come into compliance with the program, had gone through our training, really knew how to identify the sign, signs and symptoms, was curious about what she was seeing, reached out to the Bartlett Tree Expert Company, um, 
they had been doing work on the property and uh, fortunately had been working with the program recently as well. And they felt pretty confident in what they had found, uh, reached out to us. We went out there, I think the next day and determined that there were six infested red maple trees in the parking lot of the Faulkner Hospital, just a stone's throw away from the Arnold Arboretum, which is, uh, I believe, the oldest arboretum in the country, if not one of the oldest. So. Um, yeah, it was, it was a bit concerning, but through extensive surveys, both ground and aerial using climbing snap, as well as chemical treatment, we were uh, fortunately able to declare that Boston satellite eradicated in 2014. And I think that's a, a testament to er, something that we all preach, uh, uh, early detection, right? If we, can, uh, if we can get it quick, we have a really good opportunity to uh, stifle that spread and eradicate that insect. And uh, within four years, that was quite the accomplishment. And I think it also helped that the day we responded, those six infested trees were detected. We also were able to pull out two adult beetles. It took, uh, took six hours of somebody climbing that tree, but they were able to find both of them. The Worcester regulated area includes uh, six municipalities. Um, some are fully regulated, others are just portions. 110 square miles. And this map is up to date as far as infested trees and 2021 doesn't have any tree detections, but we did have one tree detected, oops, excuse me. We had one tree detected in Auburn, Massachusetts, and we'll, we'll get into that in a couple of slides uh, that, that was found in early 2020. But um, the poll question, I believe I did this right. Perfect, Ryan. Yep, and Jeffrey uh, will get that started. And just as a friendly reminder of folks who want pesticide credits, to please answer this poll question. And anyone viewing can also answer the poll question, but it's especially important for folks looking for credit for attending. Okay. So yeah, in what year was the Boston infestation declared eradicated? Yeah. Am I good to go on to the no, next slide? No, not yet. Sure. I'll let you know. Thanks, Jeffrey. Eighty percent of you have answered the question. I'll give you fifteen seconds to answer the question before I close it. Question closed. Um, the results as 2014, I believe, was the answer, and 69% of people uh, got it correct. I got 69% of people listening to me. That's good. So you can go ahead now. Thanks, Jeffrey. A uh, few of the numbers for the uh, Worcester infestation. Uh, no need to repeat those as you can see them right there, but I would like to note that uh, the last infested tree, or the most recent removed infested tree was in March of 2020. The last high risk removals we conducted were in uh, August of 2017. And the last full host removal uh, or acreage removal that was conducted was in 2018. So while there has been a significant number of trees removed, uh, we're at that stage of the program, and I hope we continue to be at that stage of the program where we're finding less and less infested trees. Um, yeah, we've been working our way towards eradication eventually. Looking at the uh, infested tree detections, very nice to see a downward uh, curve on that. Um, again, that one tree that was found in 2020 and um, you know, going back from 2009, 2010, when we really uh, dove into it, um, happy to see that uh, for the most part, a steady decline in detections. And something I like to note here um, to bolster, you know, these numbers is that um, the staffing has remained consistent, if not increased, uh, staff on the ground conducting ground survey, staff in the trees, contracted staff, it has uh, stayed steady throughout and um, 
you know, so the decrease in infested tree detections isn't for a lack of effort. It's uh, truly the staff here have done some incredible things and um, definitely owe a lot of that to the public as well. This is the infested tree that I mentioned that was detected in Auburn. Um, it was found right at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. So uh, the dating and uh, aging of this tree has been a bit delayed, but uh, it was an interesting find. It was out in the middle of the fairway of a golf course. It had exit holes on it. So the infestation had been there for a bit of time. And through, uh, again, extensive surveys around that property, ground survey, aerial survey, we found no other infested trees. And uh, so this is looking like an opportunity to reconstruct this infestation. So working with uh, collaborators in the Forest Service, uh, Dr. Talda Trotter is pictured there, um, Bill Panagakos from the Otis uh, Research Lab out in Cape Cod. Um, they're gonna be painstakingly going through all these samples, cutting them, aging them, uh, sanding them to get, to get that information and uh, reconstructing how that infestation or really the whole life table of that tree. And that um, will be beneficial to not just our program, but I think all the programs and it'll feed into some of our modeling as well. This is a uh, overview of some of the work that we've been um, doing, well, all of the work that we've been doing over the last several years. And you can see that the green indicates completed work. Uh, of, I think uh, since 2018, um, and yellow indicates some of the work that's in progress uh, or just work in progress in general. And really just to note the areas that are outlined in blue but are not shaded in, mostly on the periphery of this regulated area and outside of it is where our staff and our efforts will be targeted over the next couple of years. So if you are in any of these adjacent communities or towns or just for your knowledge, that's where uh, some of our staff will, well, majority of our staff will be focused. And this is a map of uh, some buffers that were drawn around infested trees that uh, we've determined for a number of reasons, either the, uh, sorry, my daughter, uh, either, for, either because they were so heavily infested or because we were unable to conduct full host removals around those trees or we were limited in our capacity to do removals, we determined that it is important to have those trees climbed. So the goal is to have all these areas climbed. It is a pretty slow process, but very thorough um, by the end of the program. Uh, this model has been shared numerous times, so I don't want to spend too much time on it but would like to note that um, the overall risk of our regulated area has decreased in Massachusetts. Um, that's due to all the work that we've been doing, the tree removals that have occurred, also some modifications to the model. We were able to remove some of the hardscape, uh, such as roads and uh, buildings that were showing up as hot red because they, you know, by default were, any, were unable to be surveyed because there were actually no trees there. To run through the criteria pretty quickly that goes into determining this risk model, it is a year since last survey, uh, land type, wind direction, level of infestation, um, the removal operations, and the survey efficacy. You apply a flat rate of survey efficacy to either ground survey or a climbing survey. I think it's a 30% effectiveness and 70% effectiveness, um, respectively, and that's on the very low end because we do like to have this be a conservative model. And trapping, we've uh, been winding down on that uh, quite a bit, but uh, the State uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation has still maintained uh, some trapping operations. So there's 225 traps placed and zero beetles caught. Uh, outreach and other updates. Um, you know, it's been a tough year to conduct outreach and uh, I'm really impressed with what our crew has done. It's been a lot of uh, at home Riker Mount insect display um, design and creation. Some of the more creative ones here pictured or one of them rather. Uh, we've been assisting other programs because we do have some staff that are skilled. We do have the supplies and it was already a process we were working through. So there were requests for a spot of lanternfly uh, displays to be created in addition to uh, 
Animal Dashboard, a few of those, and just you know a couple of areas where those were distributed in years past. We've had international requests, and um, I believe we've sent some to Canada as well. And oh yes, um, you know we've always been working towards utilizing unmanned aerial uh, survey devices or uh, UAVs to um, aid and assist with some of the more dangerous trees to climb or trees that you were unable to climb. And we're one step closer to that. We did have a few staff in each of the ALB programs obtain um, the FFA, FAA uh, license to um, utilize UAS devices. So hopefully next year we can actually get some devices in hand and um, put them into action. And a wood chip study has been underway for the last couple of years. And I think it's going to be close to publication, but looking at another way to regulate wood chips and versus the size of the wood chip, one inch and two dimensions, we now have the opportunity to look at it by the RPMs that the chipper is putting out. So processing that wood destroys the insect at a certain speed. Uh, no matter what the size of the wood chip is that comes out. So just um, not replacing our regula uh, regulations, but just another option for companies to work to come in compliance. Service calls, uh, again, these are calls from the public indicating that they have a suspicious tree or an insect. And uh, we try to respond to every one of those in person, if it's reasonable, if not through email, through phone call, and uh, excited to see that there was about 600 uh, of those service calls over the last year. Another poll question. In what town was the most recent infested tree detected in Massachusetts? Thank you, Ryan, and thank you, Jeffrey, for starting that. And again, another friendly reminder to please answer this poll question as quickly as possible if you would like pesticide credit. And we'll give folks a little bit of time to answer. Whole question will close in 10 seconds. Closed. So 85% answered Auburn, Massachusetts. I guess that was the correct answer. Yes, it was. So, can move on. All right. Sorry, apologies. I'm trying to convince my daughter that she doesn't need to sing at that high volume. Uh, Asian longhorn beetle in Ohio. That is uh, another pro program that we have up and running, and we have uh, had it uh, about ten years now out there not really much to update they've been working diligently through the pandemic as uh, alongside um, the other programs they uh, are sitting at about 50 square seven square miles uh, of area regulated they were able to declare one of their satellites deregulated back in 2019 and um, they continue to find infested trees uh, unfortunately they're finding some uh, still in their core. They've had some challenges with uh, just land type down there, uh, getting all those infested trees removed and some other challenges with uh, access to properties, but they're, they're doing a great job. And that's pretty much what we have for an update for Ohio, New York. Really they have Long Island remaining. Um, Brooklyn and Queens were deregulated in the last couple of years and um, that area has been reduced down to 53 square miles uh, regulated area. And in 2020, there were approximately 20, well, 21 trees detected 
um, they had been conducting surveys towards the outer edge of this regulated area. And I think a suspicious, a suspicious tree and uh, brought them into the center again. And they found, uh, I think that's, I think they finished surveying that. I think they climbed those trees and found uh, while there were several of them, I think many of them were lightly infested. So that was a good sign as well. And on to South Carolina. So this infestation was um, detected in a very similar way to all the other infestations. It concerned homeowner living in a homeowner's association had been seeing her tree um, go into decline, her red maple tree in her front yard. She had um, wanted it removed and she was having some trouble getting the approval to do so through the homeowners association. And that tree ended up just being um, a pulpy rotting, I guess, stick in her front yard and she was finally fed up. So she uh, did some internet searching, reached out to her son who I believe is uh, involved in agriculture in some way with some photos of that tree. And through those conversations, through uh, internet uh, picture searches, determined that she might have Asian longhorn beetles. So she called that in. Um, Clemson University responded uh, in South Carolina. Clemson and specifically the Department of Plant Industry handles many, if not all of their invasive species work. Uh, a little different from what I'm used to in Massachusetts where the state has, uh, you know, both the Department of Conservation and Recreation and uh, Department of Agriculture. From what I understand in South Carolina, that's all written into the state constitution to be run through Clemson. So working uh, with them as primary partners. So uh, that tree was found and a few more were quickly found after that. I had the opportunity to go down for about two weeks initially when that detection occurred, just to help set up and really take a look around to see what we were dealing with. And since then, uh, a number of our staff from Massachusetts, Ohio, and New York have gone down there to respond. And so a couple of these photos, mo actually most of these slides and photos are from experiences of other folks. Um, I uh, just wanna give credit to them when the time's appropriate. So infested trees so far as of last week's report, uh, 4,993, um, and that is still focused in our core area. We have a lot of staff, uh, well actually majority of the staff is focused there. There are not a lot of staff there yet. The state regulated area is approximately 73 square miles and the federal regulated area will follow suit soon. If you can look at this, if you're focusing on the map right now, you see an infested tree sitting right outside the northern edge of the current regulated area. That was found a couple of weeks after um, the first expansion, so likely uh, that area is going to get bumped out in the future. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, um, it's a pretty interesting scenario down there in South Carolina and uh, a lot of research to be done as far as um, this beetle. You know, we thought we had covered it all, but uh, now it moves further south than I think it's even known to go in its native host range. And uh, don't, don't quote me on that, but that's what I understand. Um, we're looking at, um, you know, no hard freeze really down there in South Carolina, you're looking at uh, um, trees uh, really being able to support these insects all year long. And we're finding fresh egg sites. I think there was some found even in December. So uh, trying to understand what we're, what, what we're dealing with, potentially the insect is just on a one year life cycle, if not just continually reproducing and emerging. So one of the advantages we have in Massachusetts is you go through the winter, the hard freeze, obviously the snow, and that um, provides you some breathing time to make plans to remove these trees, conduct some thorough surveys to make sure you've pulled it out of an area without a risk of, uh, you know, it spreading. But down there, it might just be a constant moving target. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to get to the next slide. Another thing that we noticed down there is a lot of the trees, at least in that core infestation, um, that were in decline since um, not many of them were approved to be cut down. I think some of the homeowners did it themselves in the woods behind their property and they stacked it up for firewood. 
or they put it out for brush removal. And uh, I guess it's a good thing, but firewood isn't a, isn't a big deal down in South Carolina, as you could imagine. So a lot of that stuff just stays on site. So we found a lot of piles similar to this, um, some of them in uh, later stages of decay, but they were infested. Uh, we had uh, pieces of elm, pieces of willow, maple trees, but a lot of it was just left on site. And another benefit that we're seeing, at least initially, was that uh, the Charleston County landfill is pretty close to this area and now is actually incorporated into the regulated area. And it seems that a lot of the material all was centralized and sent there. And uh, it was refreshing to go to that site and talk to the people processing the material and said that they processed that the, the wood uh, and the brush pretty much daily and any larger trees are processed pretty much every couple of days. So that was really reassuring and, and impressive. Okay, now this is a slide that was produced by David Coyle, a researcher with Clemson University. And, uh, you know, you can tell from the slide, he's speculating that um, the beetle came from Ohio. That's because the genetic uh, analysis of that says it's an exact match to the beetle um, in Ohio. Though, you know, that could also say that those infestations potentially started at the same time, maybe. Um, they could have started at different times, but came from the same area in Asia. So there's, there's still some more tracing to be done, but um, it does match the Ohio um, genetic makeup. So, how did it get in there? How did it get to South Carolina? It's gonna be a tough one. Um, that area where it was first detected might be the core. It is some of the heavily, more heavily infested trees down there, but it doesn't seem like there's any industry, any, any, um, any centralized point, no aha uh, moment. So you start looking around, there's the Port of Charleston, the Port of Savannah. Uh, so far in collaboration with SITSI, the Port of Charleston, I believe records going back as far as uh, 17 years, uh, international shipments have been reviewed and not, no red flags have come up. The closest, I think the term was uh, final destination of a product directly from Asia was approximately eight miles away from the known infested site. Still work to be done at the Port of Savannah. And in that uh, very close to the core area, as it is known now and might eventually be included in that area, is uh, quite a large RV park. That RV park, in walking through it, uh, a number of heavily infested trees, just uh, walking some of their paths and you know taking a tangent path through the woods, it was quite easy to pick off infested trees. So this aerial view, what you're looking at, a lot of the maples around that water uh, down in the bottom of the picture, those are actually infested. Um, there's quite a few large maples that the property owner is quite fond of for the foliage. Um, those are infested as well. So great care is being taken to conduct a thorough survey in there and work with the property owner as he's been very cooperative, understands what we're trying to do, wants to help out. But, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, many of those trees are infested and could have been potentially, you know, you can't really point fingers, but with all those people traveling, that is a method of uh, introduction, right? Somebody could have potentially brought something in, but um, definitely no smoking guns there. And just tourism in general, a lot of great spots down there uh, in and around Charleston, Charleston itself, Hilton Head, Savannah. And uh, as far as railroads go, I should have indicated it before. Let me let me just jump up a couple more slides to show you, or try to talk you through it. Really, um, there is a railroad line where Route 17 is on the map, or is it 117? Maybe it's not very easily distinguished on this map, and I apologize. But um, there's a railroad line that runs kind of northeast through this infestation and um, 
driving down that uh, access road and walking alongside of the railroad, uh, you could easily pick off some infested red maples. And so in between that point on that railroad, as the crow flies directly back to the infestation, there is uh, several hundred acres of swamp. And that's where you're finding most of the host trees and most of those host trees are red maples. What's interesting down there is the, the maple, unfortunately, is not really predominant. You're not really seeing it um, in people's property other than you know, a planted landscape tree or um, as a weed tree in some kind of culvert they have. But uh, when you do find them, they are pretty condensed in, in swampy areas and on sides of highways. So there's been a couple of times where we pull over, find some red maples and they're infested. So a bit of a different dynamic down there as far as um, hosts go. And this slide, some excellent artwork by the Ohio program director. I don't want to take credit for that, of uh, indicating that there is ALB on that, on that island. That is uh, an island that has recently been um, declared or turned into a park and uh, another opportunity to conduct some research to maybe reconstruct that infestation. There are a number of infested trees on there. Along with um, that research, there uh, also has to be some um, work conducted on how we're actually going to remove those trees from that marsh area, from that island. And uh, this bridge, there's a lot of properties all along this this waterway that have these wooden bridges out to these these islands. So somebody could have maybe dumped something out there, or the beetle just took flight. It, it's not that uh, long of a flight. So again, a lot of a lot of conversations still need to be had. Um, some more research needs to be done. Poll question. When was the first infested tree reported in South Carolina? Thank you again, Ryan, and I'm sure folks know by now, but another friendly reminder to please answer this as quickly as possible, especially if you would like pesticide credit. Poll question closes in 15 seconds. Poll closed. Um, 65% I said May 2022, and uh, I believe that was the correct answer. May 2020, not 2022. Sorry. So I'm gonna say, you're telling the future, <laughs> Jeffrey. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, again, on the trend of challenges, and this is this this is with any uh, new infestation of any pest, really, but um, with ALB. Uh, you know, just really trying to establish the area you're working with, um, the environment you're working in before before diving in um, and conducting those removal operations. Uh, yeah, there's there's a number of protected species in this area. Um, it's it's near some waterways. It's near some um, marshy uh, areas. It's it's actually some beautiful uh, hiking around there. But uh, with that, you have a lot of nature. So there's a number of bald eagle nests that have been either previously known. So you're looking at those yellow pins. Those are known bald eagle nests. The one to the right, to the east, uh, the blue dot that was found by some uh, ALB staff. So some folks are pretty proud of that. And this area is known as a wood stork uh, rookery. And uh, the wood stork is a protected species. And I'll show you a slide shortly of one of the challenges, one of the more specific challenges we're dealing with. Um, I'll jump to that slide actually. 
so this um, this is a, an island known as a woodstork rookery. You can see potentially some of those nests. Some photos that were taken from, uh, I believe, some staff. And now this is, uh, that arrow is indicating that island um, from the air. And all those red dots are actually infested trees that were found around this, uh, this, this pond and this rookery. So uh, as you can imagine, that's, um, oh, that's, that's, that's a big challenge right there. And uh, how do you get in there? How do you actually conduct that work to be effective in eradicating the beetle from the area and also protecting the wood stork? Um, on top of that, it is known locally as a nuisance gator dump. I guess any of the gators that get in and around that neighborhood, uh, people are just pick them up and I, I guess toss them into that pond. So it's a gator stock pond with uh, threatened species and a lot of infested trees. So, <laughs> you know, um, definitely a challenge. And obviously staff safety is a challenge. This is probably one of the more um, dangerous areas we've had to send staff into a lot of knee deep water, a lot of waist deep water that you can't see the bottom of. There's a number of venomous snakes down there. Um, we have um, encountered, I believe, uh, some rattlesnakes. I believe it was a couple of uh, copperheads. Um, no one's actually been bitten, but they're there. And as far as gators go, uh, the occasional baby alligator, a couple of um, road roadside, um, unfortunately, uh, roadkill alligators. Uh, and fortunately, no one's actually encountered it while in the water, but um, that, that is a challenge. Uh, also, to wrap it up, some of the other challenges are just, um, you know, getting people out in the field and working and interacting in the, with the public, you know, and while there's a pandemic going on. Um, a lot of this, a lot of the reasons as to why ALB is um, something that we've been so successful in eradicating is we've worked with the public, we've worked with the communities, and they are the ones, um, you guys are the ones that have made it uh, so possible to do this work. And, and it's been it's been a challenge and uh, impressed with what staff have been able to accomplish down there so far. Uh, logistically, they're in the process of setting up a permanent office space. Right now, they're sitting in, a, uh, in an office space on the College of Charleston. They were happy to open that up for staff or operations. Both the Department of Plant Industry for Clemson and the USDA is conducting some hiring for survey staff, for administrative staff, for uh, supervisory staff. And, um, you know, requests for help are still going out within PBQ to get staff down there to assist with surveys. Um, a marshalling yard or a wood disposal yard or just a location or some sort of some locations we can possibly work with to bring into compliance trying to determine the best way to set that up to process that infested material and uh, infested material in general has you know so there's been some small removal operations for the sake of research going on down there really trying to get in there to date some of that uh, those have most heavily infested trees while I was down there, observed a few trees with hundreds of exit holes on them, some, some, some large trees, probably over 30 inches in diameter that were completely stone dead. Uh, so that's not just a, a piece of, that's not just a tree you can cut up and send up to the Otis Research Lab out in the Cape. That's something where the researchers need to go to it. And currently they're down there uh, obtaining the appropriate equipment, finding some office space to process that material. And, and really, um, hopefully in the next year, we can get a better idea of what we're working with down there. Uh, the other challenge, another challenge, <laughs> not the other, there's a lot of development in that area. There's a lot of houses going up, a lot of uh, communities, homeowners associations being built. Uh, you walk through the woods, finding infested trees, and you come to a clearing where it's just walls of plywood. So, um, you know, curious as to where those trees went because the infestation didn't just stop conveniently at the edge of that uh, that wood lot, you know? So uh, a lot of detective work needs to go on as well. I could probably talk on and on, but I'm looking at the time. I have about four minutes, so just wanted to uh, answer any questions. So sorry for going over, Tony. 
Oh, no worries, Ryan. Actually, you're uh, right on time. So I do have questions coming in for you, and so let's get started with those. Um, and I apologize if I uh, mispronounce uh, this first questioner's name. Maritza uh, asks, does this insect infest only ornamental trees? Um, no, no. It, uh, it, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the, well, what we're seeing in Massachusetts and what we've observed, the preferred hosts are maple, elm, birch, and willow. And while there are ornamental versions of those trees, we're finding that uh, because of the prevalence of red maple, that's what you're going to find infested in, in Massachusetts. And it's upwards to 98% of the infestations in Massachusetts uh, have a maple tree present. So that's saying if uh, you're going to go out in the woods and you find an infested birch tree, 98% of the time there's going to be an infested maple next to it. So that really is uh, one of their preferred hosts. And it may be different in different areas, but um, yeah, some of those ornamentals, if they are a maple, if they are an elm, uh, a willow, as we observed in South Carolina, some of these trees planted in their front yards, they do become infested. Thank you. So it sounds like ornamental trees as well as forested uh, or native trees in our forests. Yeah, um, great. And I think in uh, this is related, uh, and you sort of already answered this, but Larry asks, what tree species are most attractive to Asian longhorn beetle? Uh, all right, to answer this, I'll try to be succinct. Really, again, maples, elm, birches, and willows in Ohio, since they have a lot of buckeye, uh, chestnut, and uh, those you find to be heavily, or many of those infested trees. Massachusetts, again, because of the prevalence of maple, you're going to find a lot of those, but uh, maple, elm, birch, and willow. Perfect. Thank you. Let's see. Another mm -hmm. question I have uh, from Jan. What size tree does Asian longhorn beetle infest? Should we be diligently looking mm -hmm. at our nursery stock or our stock as growers of a smaller nursery trees? So she's asking, you know, is there mm -hmm. a risk to the trees under two inches dBH? Mm -hmm. Yeah, tr regularly, normally we say uh, trees under two inches in diameter um, aren't really something that the beetle would choose to infest, but we do find in heavily infested areas that uh, a beetle can develop in a uh, branch that is under one inch in diameter. Um, so we've, we've seen that from uh, whips in the forest to uh, a piece of a Norway maple growing in someone's fence, in their uh, metal fence, find exit holes on that. So. Yeah, you, you, we need to check all that material. Um, you know, if it's a host plant, it is regulated, uh, if it's inside the, a regulated area. But fortunately, the size of that beetle, how bright um, and, uh, you know, easy it is to, to see when you have those smaller trees, you can quickly give a glance over and uh, see if you're seeing any signs and symptoms. Thank you. Great. Uh, another question we have, and there's more coming in. I'll try to get as many of them to you as I can. Uh, Rachel asks, are there other parts of Massachusetts that have had any infestations of Asian longhorn beetle other than the Boston and Worcester areas? No, there are not other areas in Massachusetts where we've detected Asian longhorn beetle. We've responded to hundreds of uh, calls outside of the regulated area. Um, we've conducted site checks at a number of uh, uh, industry uh, locations, tree companies that have voluntarily had us out to their properties, checked hundreds of those to see if they brought anything back on accident. And uh, fortunately, we have not found anything out there. Thank you. Yep. Uh, uh, let's see another question from uh, Denise, or, or uh, yes, Denise, uh, what do you mean by the landfill in South Carolina processed daily uh, and asking were trees sure. burned? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, so just um, to be more uh, specific, the material rather than sitting, rather than a, uh, the the truck coming and dumping all this woody material um, and letting it sit for you know weeks until a contractor came in to chip that up, they fortunately had a processor running daily. So as the material was dropped off, um, an employee of the landfill would take that woody material and run it through a chipper. So it was getting processed in that way that it was getting chipped up. Um, you know, down there, it seemed that you put out your woody material and your brush, you can put it out weekly, but you put it in a separate pile so it's not picked up with the trash. 
and uh, trees that were cut down that are too large to chip, they, they sat for a couple of days, but were processed pretty, pretty quickly relative to what you might see around here. Thank you. I've got a couple of folks asking questions along the lines of, are there other ways to manage Asian longhorn beetles? So uh, Patrick asks, can birds be used to control ALB? And Kathleen is asking if there are any parasitic wasps or other um, uh, natural enemies that uh, can uh, help manage Asian longhorn beetles. So can you speak to that a little bit? Sure, sure. Uh, there's been several observations in the field um, that, you know, birds are out there assisting with the eradication effort, woodpeckers, uh, even, even people have said they've observed, you know, their cat playing with uh, an Asian longhorn beetle. But um, really that's, um, you know, and looking at those, it's not just, it's not a viable option. Um, you know, looking at mammals to to aid in eradication, but um, looking at wasps, there have been several attempts to st uh, look at biocontrol options going over to China, evaluating, or just Asia in general, evaluating maybe some of the pests there, some of the parasitic wasps. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of the host range testing, when you bring that, pa that parasitic wasp back uh, to a lab here in the States, come to find out that it is not specific enough, that it is not targeting ALB only, it is targeting other potentially native pests, uh, uh, native insects. So we don't really have anything we can release at this time, but there is further research underway to see if we have any native parasitoids, any native wasps that live around here, that maybe we can increase in uh, some numbers and release those to aid in the eradication effort. Uh, great answer. Um, let's see another question from Jan. Could RVers uh, bring firewood with them and transport ALB if, for example, they cut down a dying tree and then use it for for firewood? Uh, and yeah, I think that was in relation to maybe an earlier slide. Yeah, yeah. Um, the RV park again. Um, we've seen in Massachusetts within this regulated area. Uh, we've traced a number of infestations within the 110 square mile area to somebody moving wood, whether it's purchasing firewood, whether it's giving wood to their uh, to their brother on the other side of town, somebody stacking that wood, splitting it, putting it under their maple tree in their backyard, the beetle emerging uh, later on and infesting that tree. And in the Northeast with firewood being such a, a you know, commodity, such a, a big business, um, there is a lot of concern there, right? Because you can easily transport that and, uh, you know, a lot of states don't allow you to bring your own firewood uh, to your campsite. Down in South Carolina, that could have happened. It, you know, there's there's definitely fires at those RV parks. Um, I'm not sure if you know if they had the space. Maybe they did bring that material with them. So it could be it could be something there. I think we're gonna have to do some dating of the infested trees within that RV park to see if there may be some of the oldest infested trees. But that's to be determined. Thank you. A follow-up question, uh, and someone had asked this, how do you date infested trees? Sure, sure. And I apologize for not including the slide on that. That's a good one. Um, really, well, the, the, you know, it takes, it takes some skill, but uh, you're standing, you're taking that, uh, that exit hole, and you're cutting right down the middle of the exit hole. So if you're looking at the exit hole, it's that perfect round circle. Um, it looks like, you know, it's dime-sized. So it's, it's large enough to put a saw blade through it. So you're cutting right down the middle of that. And then you're sanding it down several times with really fine grit till you can get to the point where you can count the rings of the tree from the egg site. Um, so the cross section, eventually that, uh, I'm sorry, from the exit hole. So eventually you can count back to where that exit hole stopped. And then that's how you're gonna date uh, the tree. So really it's, um, counting the rings that have grown since the beetle emerged from that from that exit hole is a way to look at that. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. I think we have a couple more minutes for a few of these questions coming in. Uh, one from mm -hmm. Rachel: uh, Is the Asian longhorn beetle a strong flyer? For example, will it be traveling long distances on its own, or is the primary mode of transportation because of human involvement? Um, in comparison to some of the other pests people might be familiar with, like Emerald Dash Borer, that can fly, uh, you know, pretty easily, uh, quite quite a large distance. Asian longhorn beetle is not really a great flyer and does not necessarily take flight too quickly. 
uh, again, anecdotally, walking up, knocking a beetle off of a tree, watching it crawl back to its tree and climb back up the trunk versus taking flight. That that does happen, but um, you know there are, and there are observations in uh, Ohio where uh, rows of trees in between soybean fields you'll find some infested and then other rows not. So even the the size of a field might deter uh, a beetle from flying out uh, and possibly they turn back around and fly back to their host tree. But if that host tree is dead, they're gonna they're gonna take flight. Um, so they're gonna have to go somewhere. But you know in general not not the best flyers thank you all right a lot of great mm -hmm. questions in here i'm going to try to get two more of them out to you um one question from howie is since the auburn mass find will the uh, uh regulated area be expanding as a result of that in massachusetts no that and thank you for bringing that up howie i should have noted it um it was found in an area that was already regulated. And uh, let's see. Um, I'm not seeing, well, anyways, no, it was, or it was, where it was found was an area where it was, had we had already included in our regulated boundaries because of a previously detected infested tree. So um, while it was unfortunate that we did find it, um, we did not have to expand. We had already been regulating and surveying the area around there. Thank you. And I think probably the last question that we have time for today is from Jan. Uh, what should folks be looking for this time of year in order to help detect Asian longhorn beetle? Great. Thanks. Another great question. And how I always like to, to wrap that stuff up. You're, at this time of the year in particular, um, it's a great opportunity to see the full tree without the leaves on it. Um, and you're going to be looking at those exit holes. You can see the emergence hole picture here. Um, you know, a dime's there in comparison. And it's, it's gonna be a perfect circle. It's gonna look almost artificial. And if you were to place a pencil or a stick into that hole, it's gonna sit perpendicular to the tree. Uh, that's, that's one of the indicators we look at because there are other insects that make perfectly round exit holes that emerge um, on an angle. So if you see something, even just seeing an exit hole like that, feel free to call our office or visit asianlonghornbeetle.com and report that. And we'd be happy to go out there and either speak with you or check out the tree. The other signs and symptoms, um, you're looking for the egg sites. This time of the year, that might be a little darker. Um, uh, but they're, they're still going to be there. And uh, those those oval pits, and if you could imagine uh, a female's mandibles working side by side, pinching away at that, you're going to see these little lines in there that she chewed that uh, chewed, chewed into that with. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, great presentation. Thank you for fielding so many great questions from the audience. I do want to highlight that I just uh, shared in the chat with everyone uh, some contact information uh, for the great. eradication program in Massachusetts, as well as MDAR uh, and the national uh, phone number and website that you can report any suspicious trees, damage, uh, beetles <laughs> that you think might be ALB. So thank you again, Ryan. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity, Tani. Thanks, uh, everybody, for tuning in and listening. Always happy to uh, discuss. And if I didn't answer any questions or if there's any content anyone was interested in, you know, feel free to reach out. Always happy to uh, jump on another call presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan. And I can share some of those questions uh, that have come in that we ran out of time for with you as Please. well. All right, so what I'm going to do is take over the screen here in a second once I can get my uh, PowerPoint up and ready. Um, and we are going to enter into a brief break before our second speaker. Uh, so if everybody can, please uh, feel free to stand up, <laughs> move around, uh, get a coffee or whatever you need. And we will take a 10 minute or at this point, nine minute break and return promptly at 1110 uh, for our next presentation. So thank you all.
Okay, Kate, I am going to switch the screen over to you since it appears we have reached 11.10. And let me see if I can do that. You should get a prompt momentarily. Yep. Excellent. And now I can see you and I can see your title slide. So, whoops, your title slide disappeared. <laughs> there we go. Is that back up? Uh, it's a blue screen right now, but that could be a delay on my end. There we go. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so let me introduce our next speaker and presentation. I'm very excited to have here with us today Kate Aikenhead. She is our state plant health director with the USDA USDA APHIS PPQ. Uh, she is the state plant health director for Massachusetts, but also for Connecticut and Rhode Island. And uh, she will be speaking with us today about trapping for new invasive insects in Massachusetts, as well as 2021 updates uh, and an APHIS update for us. So thank you so much uh, and take it away, Kate. Great, well, thank you for having me. Um, Tony really took care of the introduction already. Uh, but we'll just move into some of the slides and uh, just appreciate everybody uh, being on the webinar today to provide some additional information on the programs that we are doing and some of the outcomes from the pest detection work already being done. I'm going to turn off my video uh, and move right into the slides. Okay, great. So, um, as Tony mentioned, I'm, I, I work with the U.S. Department of Agriculture Animal Plant Health Inspection Service plant protection and quarantine. And uh, we use a lot of acronyms. So I'm gonna say uh, APHIS PPQ a lot uh, in, in, in the presentation um, for those of you who may not uh, be aware of some of our initials. So, um, hold on, okay, there we go. Next slide. Um, all right, sorry about that quick technical <laughs> technical difficulty. Uh, as Tony mentioned, a quick overview of what we're gonna be talking about, uh, some of our programs and responses that we're doing, also the surveys that happened in 2020 and the surveys that we're planning for 2021, um, and also a little bit about reporting and outreach. So I, I often like to think of pest detection and what we're doing in PPQ as a continuum uh, of uh, inspection, um, and response continuum. Our mission in PPQ is to prevent the introduction and establishment of economically and environmentally significant pests while facilitating trade, safe trade of agricultural products. That starts at our ports of entry uh, and the inspections at our ports of entry are done by our partners uh, with the Customs and Border Protection, the CBP, and the it, it starts with looking at any of that cargo or even agricultural cargo or cargo that is not agricultural but could be harboring or, or carrying hitchhiking pests. Of course, inspections can't be 100%. Um, we're not, they're not able to look at everything. And so that enters into our next step in the continuum where we have pest detection programs uh, both within PPQ and also with our state cooperators. We work together uh, with, with, all state off, with our state offices in our Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program. Uh, we call that CAPS. We also have uh, the Plant Protection Act, um, Section 7721, used to formerly known as the Farm Bill, but there is a lot of pest detection survey work funded through that um, through that program as well. And then from there, through the detection efforts, if we if there is something found to be a potentially uh, economic or environmental significance that requires action or the setting up of programs, there is uh, emergency programs responses. Uh, we partner often with states, stakeholders, and industry in those responses to ensure that uh, rapid response to any addition, any new pests or fines. So with that, I, I kind of am going to start at the end of that continuum because the most of this this talk I want to focus on are the middle part, the pest detection, uh, but just quickly go over some of the program PPQ programs and the highlights um, for some of the things that had happened have, have happened in 2020. First, I, I'm gonna talk quickly about Ralstonia, um, a, a, few, a little bit of information about Asian giant hornet. 
some unsolicited seeds from China, and then we'll also speak about spotted lanternfly and the emerald ash borer deregulation. So for Asian giant horn, um, I'm assuming some folks may have seen some media cover on that. It did happen um, with a lot of folks in the middle of the pandemic or when it was just beginning. Um, it's not known to occur in New England. We do not have Asian giant hornet here. It is only known right now in the state of Washington, but it did get um, major press. So there was a lot, it was a popular inquiry topic. Uh, we've got a lot of calls about it. A lot of our state partners got calls about it. And it's just, it's cool to highlight, I feel, because it shows some great science in that what um, the Washington Department of Agriculture was able to do is uh, in this one picture in the, in the bottom here, you can see they put like a little, a little radio transmitter on one of those Asian giant hornets and they were able to track it back to its nest and they are currently working um, to eradicate that. So you can see the folks there with the Washington Department of Agriculture in some protective gear to um, take care of that nest. So it's still under eradication. They're working to eradicate that and finding some success with that. Uh, and then again, just to highlight, it is not here, not in New England. Um, it's just right now in, in Washington. So Ralstonia, this was this is a disease that is uh, of high concern. Uh, it, it impacts solanaceous crops, so it is a concern for agriculture. It, it is also found in geraniums. So uh, it was April of 2020, right when we were just a few weeks into our shutdowns, when it, we were provided notice that uh, geraniums from some offshore cutting plants had been found um, to be infected uh, with Ralstonia race three biovar two. So we, uh, all the credit goes out to our staff that uh, in the middle of the pan, in the beginning of the pandemic went out to greenhouses that were in impacted. Uh, we were provided lists of who had received these infected geraniums and we were able to go uh, remove all of those geraniums and they were destroyed. So there were three different phases. There were two uh, impacted varieties and then also a third and final phase where there was survey done at uh, locations that had received material from that offshore production uh, plant, um, greenhouse to verify that there wasn't any additional uh, Ralstonia out there and that we had mitigated any risk of that pathway. So a very exciting that in just two months, uh, we were able, PPQ was able to declare that uh, Ralstonia had been eradicated from greenhouses. It was never in the environment, strictly in the greenhouse environment. And um, through that rapid response and programming, we were able to get all infected material and destroy it. So then next, right from there, we moved into unsolicited seeds from China. Uh, it, this also got some media coverage, uh, may have seen some news stories about it. And this was an e-commerce e brushing scam. And basically, they were finding that some of these retailers in specifically China, where we found from, were sending unsolicited packages to the United States to be able to the feedback on uh, for their company through these e-commerce large sites and then boost their rating and then boost their uh, from what we were able to uh, find out with this is seats happen to be very, very small, very light, very easy to ship. And so that was one of the products that these uh, uh, one, once the public where uh, they were reporting, we were receiving hundreds of reports a day through our office, through the state cooperator's office um, of folks who had been receiving these unsolicited packages. So the question is, what's the risk? We wanted to verify the pathway. And so PPQ would ask that all of these packages be sent to our offices so they can be routed for identification so we could find out what type of seeds they would um, learn was what we found was that most of them were common flower and vegetable seeds. Um, there were a few instances of federal noxious weed seeds um, and some pests and diseases, but not not too many were found with that. So we're currently working with e-commerce and the partners to close the pathway. Um, but you can see through some of these pictures, it was just these little tiny packages. Maybe some of you folks received some of those. 
Um, and if you did, please send them. We're still collecting them. We still get here and there. Not as many in the beginning. But people were sending not just seeds, but coming unsolicited in in our office, it basically took over an entire space where we received anywhere from these little tiny seed packages to unwanted masks and toilet paper and artificial flowers. So, uh, but we are, all the seeds were routed for identification and then proper destruction. And the reason and the concern for this type of pathway is these are a highly regulated commodity. They can carry some um, diseases as well. So most seeds require some type of phytosanitary certification or inspection for legal entry into the US. And of course, these weren't receiving those. So it is an important pathway to close down, which is why PPQ is currently working with the e-commerce to ensure that we can um, put in some requirements or regulations to close down the pathway. And then I just also wanted to quickly highlight emerald ash borer deregulation. This just happened a few weeks ago, uh, as of April 14th, 2021. Emerald ash borer is no longer regulated. It was a regulated pest. We had, uh, we would issue permits and we had a quarantine areas, limited permits to um, regulate the movement of, of host material. What was found though, um, that regulations were not stopping the spread of EAB in 2002 and 2020, it reached 35 states. So we are moving on the federal side to a focus on biocontrol and science and management of the pest. So uh, there are some very promising biological control um, for, for emerald ash borer. It is egg parasitoids, larval parasitoids, and I am happy to say that all three of our states, Massachusetts and Maryland, have active biocontrol release programs ongoing in our states. And you can see here, just to quickly highlight the, this map, the yellow is all of the counties that were have been found infested with EAB, and the red are, are infested with biocontrol releases. So our goal in PPQ is to have biocontrol releases in every county where there is infestation. And by shifting that focus to biocontrol, we're going to be able to focus our efforts on that. So going back to uh, the continuing continuing continuum I had mentioned and moving into that middle part, our pest detection efforts, where I'd like to spend the majority of this talk on, is an extremely important part after that port of entry, after uh, products have entered into the country. Early detection is so important, and Ryan had talked a, a bit about that as well in his talk. Finding these pests as early as we can so that there, you know, if there is eradication or management strategies, they can be far more effective when it's low level populations and we find it early. So we focus on early detection of exotic pests that are not native, um, not widely distributed or established in the US. And we're able to do that with a multi pronged strategy to accomplish this goal, and that's um, standardized assessments, surveys. Uh, identification and, uh, and protocols so that we can have consistent survey and um, and then with detections apply that to programs if if needed. And this is also working with our with the state cooperators. They also have um, pest detection efforts that are happening. I'm only going to be talking about what we are doing um, with PP, our PPQ pest detection, but there is also programming on the state side similar to this. So, as, as I just mentioned, pest detection efforts are an integral part of this early detection of invasive species. So, I want to give all credit for our, our programs here in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island to Nicole Carrier. She's our pest survey specialist. She plans these surveys. She works with our state cooperators. She, um, and she implements these surveys. And all of our, our staff, our safeguarding specialists, our technician who just retired, um, run this entire program, um, and you can see in just a couple slides all the, all the, the I, I think really exciting things that have been found through those efforts. So in 2020, uh, there was survey in all three states. We had done this through Lindbergh funnel traps baited with ethanol, crossfeed panel traps with uh, T compestrous lure, and then also create crossfeed panel traps baited with um, ethanol. And these are more general lures so that we can get um, we can get more more catches to be able to identify and, and see what's out there. And then with that as paired, 
where do we put these traps? Where are they going to go? And that is done through risk assessments and planning efforts, uh, focusing on the high risk areas, importers who may have been receiving solid wood packing materials from foreign source, from foreign origins, distribution center, our ports. We do have a number of ports in our in our in our three states, so we want to make sure that we're focusing some efforts there as well. So you can see this is a map. This is showing where all of those trap locations were for 2020. It is important to note that we we work uh, in two-year cycles. So this year in 2020, it was focused on hardwoods, as was 2019. Um, and I'll show you a little bit later that we're going to be moving to um, conifers in, in 2021. But you can see where where we where the trap sites are spread throughout the three states. And you can see those areas that may not have traps right now in 2020, those would have been trapped in 2019. So we try to get the most coverage in the states as possible. So from our trapping in 2020, these are some of the exciting finds. Um, Heteroborops seriatus, uh, this was actually first detected in Massachusetts in 2005. It was a first US record in 2005, but we did find it again in 2020. And it was also found in some of our other state. We found it was a first state record. We found it first in Connecticut this year. We found it in a new county in Massachusetts and Franklin, and then also in some previously positive counties. So just for some information going through the maps, um, I'll be showing a couple of maps in, in the in the talk, and they are all all color coded the same. Blue is a new county record in the state. Orange is a new state record, and then the purple is where it has been previously. It was already found, but it was found in 2020, but it's not a new county or a new state find. So you can just see the map layout of where those finds were in, in our states and counties. Another, another uh, exotic that was found in 2020 survey was, was Scolitis Chevy Rui, which is the banded elm bark beetle. Most of these you'll see are native to China, Russia, Southeast Asia. This was first detected in Colorado and Utah in 2003. It is considered widespread in the US, but, and it was previously found um, in Connecticut in previous year's surveys, but this year we found it in Fairfield County. And it was previously found though in Rhode Island as well um, in previous year's surveys. And then the next one, uh, another exotic that was found in 2020 is Anisandros maichi, the ambrosia beetle, uh, again, native to Asia. It has limited distribution in the US and we first found it in Connecticut in 2017 and in Massachusetts in 2019. For 2020, it was found in two new counties in Massachusetts and Berkshire and Norfolk, Norfolk in uh, two new counties in Connecticut and also in some previously positive counties. So here's the map representation of that. And then another exotic it found in 2020 trapping was the Trichophorus campestris, uh, T. campestris is what we usually say, love it longhorn beetle. This was first detected in Utah in 2010. We are finding that it has a fairly wide distribu widespread distribution in the US, but it is still an exotic that we will um, that that comes up in our that well we haven't found it in the states before and we still it, it's not a, a program that we follow up on but it is uh, exotic pest find so it was for a first new to state records in Connecticut and Massachusetts found in two counties in Massachusetts two counties in Connecticut and you can see that on the map here and then another one of an, another find uh, in two, 2020 surveys was Xylotrechus pyrodorus, and this is a, a new to US record. So this is the first time it's been found in the US and found it in Hampton County in Massachusetts. So, and it was just determined, we just got that identification back in December of 2020. So this is very new. Currently there is um, a, a new pest advisory group, which is bringing some scientists um, together to look at the hosts, the life cycle detection methods, of this um, of this insect, and we are definitely planning to delimit the area of the find um, in 2021 to see the extent of this um, and see if we find it anywhere else. And you can see that um, on the map where we found it. So here's our first poll question. 
Thank you, Kate. And I know Jeffrey is running that poll question. Again, a friendly reminder, and for anyone who's just joining us for this presentation, if you are looking for a pesticide credit as a result of watching today's uh, webinar, please answer this poll question. And not to speed everyone along, but we have about 70% of folks voting. If you can get your answers in to this poll question quickly, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. So the question will close in 10 seconds. Question closed. Um, the results, um, all the above, I think was the correct answer and 61% of you got it right. Good. Great, all right, thank you. So also in 2020, uh, I don't think our year would be complete unless we did also include spotted lanternfly um, in our survey plans and efforts. And I know that in a previous um, offering, there has been there was a, a whole session on spotted lanternfly, but I still will provide some additional information, a little bit about what PPQ had done with spotted lanternfly in our efforts, and then also just a, a few quick pictures a little later on. Um, to show you some of the things to look for with spotted lantern fly. So um, in 2020, we had planned to do visual survey that is still uh, without, that is one of our best survey efforts right now to detect populations of spotted lantern fly. So that usually happens um, between August and October with the adults. They're the easiest to be able to survey for through visual survey. So that was our plan. And then um, if only I could sing right now, um, but I won't do that to anybody. But uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff and uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, I think, said it best that uh, our life got flipped upside down um, right after August. We did not start survey when we had planned it. Uh, our visual survey started in early September. And uh, by September 11th, uh, one of our off, uh, safeguarding specialists found spotted lanternfly in Fairfield County in Connecticut. So uh, uh, the best laid plans got completely changed once we found that it did look like it was not an instance of a single adult, it was a population likely. And so we moved from plan survey into uh, response protocols. And so while that was also happening, there were more reports coming in from the public with you know, dead uh, SLF finds um, from shipments or material that had come from known SLF infested areas. So we're seeing that this is this is a pest that that can move even you know in those infested areas when they are treating. There's you know dead SLF that might hitchhike along with um, with commodities or products. So a, a great testament to awareness of the public. We were getting those reports in, so we were following up on those as well. But back to the population, um, we did need to respond. So we moved from that visual detection survey into a delimitation survey. We moved the limited staff that we do have into visual survey around that population find to do our best to find the extent of the population. We did find that at the low population level, it can be a little cryptic. So if you look at this picture on the slide, you can see a single adult right in the middle of that that tree, that little branch, well, the, the small trunk there. And it is it is tough to see at low levels. Um, you know, a lot of the media that we see with spotted lanternfly right now shows a huge tree covered with hundreds of adults. But what we're seeing in this initial, the initial stages of infestation is a much smaller population. So um, it's getting those binoculars out there. And uh, for those folks trained in this, it's uh, it's not as easy to detect, to see as as you would think. 
Um, in addition to the visual survey, we were also deploying some of the traps um, for spotted lanternfly. Both the state and federal partners were working with that. And all of this was happening during COVID-19 where, you know, it would be great to be able to bring a large group of folks to that area to show them, hey, this is what it looks like. This is what we're seeing. But we weren't able to do that um, with the st uh, safety protocols. So it really is a response in a very different environment right now. So at the end, this is what we were able to um, pull together. We, you can see quite a few visual surveys in Connecticut, in Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Uh, we deployed a number of traps to try and help delimit that population as well. So just quickly, some photos of, of what we saw also while, um, while doing that, that survey. You can see on the left is that a single adult and on the right is an egg mass. And you can see how that blends easily into that tree. So it is not an easy pest to detect until it gets to that really high level population. And then um, this is just some more pictures from what we saw um, on the left there is actually after that freeze, the adults fell to the ground and you know you can see a couple there on the ground, but again, not the high, high levels that you're seeing in some of those um, core infested states. In total, it was found in three towns, all in Fairfield County. And just a map there. So the other paired with that visual survey, we were also, even before we had found um, the infestation, planned on doing some research trapping in cooperation with our scientists from the science, um, our science and technology lab in Otis, Massachusetts. So they've been at the forefront of a lot of the spotted lanternfly research and methods and protocols that are being developed. So uh, it's, you know, it's great to be able to partner with them, and we were able to look at some behavioral trapping um, that Nicole worked with Joe Francis out of, out of that lab for. And it was comparing three different types of trap to see if there was one that, you know, if, if there were a low level, if there were a population, which one would find it. And you can see those here. It was a bug barrier trap on the left, um, a circle trap with the bag, and then a circle trap with a jar. And those were deployed at various sites in our three states. Um, and this was all planned before there was infestation found in Fairfield County. Another aspect of this uh, research trapping was also insecticidal uh, sentinel trees. So the sentinel trees basically were set up where uh, a basal bark spray was put on um, ailanthus trees and then a tub set up just been just around that tree to be able to catch any um, SLF it were, if it were to come off. So, and here's here's some pictures of that happening. So, um, and th again, that's work with one of the scientists out of our Otis lab in Massachusetts. So you can see here some of the well, these are all of the sites where spotted lanternfly visual survey and uh, trapping. Was, was completed in the three states. You can see very highly concentrated in Fairfield County where we had found that, um, that population. And we have the next poll question. Poll question will close in 10 seconds. Poll closed. 
85% uh, got it right, and uh, 13%, 14% did not. Good. Great. Okay, so um, I think it's important. So that was a brief summary of the tra the surveys that we had done in 2020, and just moving a little bit more into Spotted Lanternfly uh, for the folks. I I hope everybody's aware of Spotted Lanternfly. I know um, it was talked about in a previous presentation, um, but I think it is. Um, important to highlight that spotted lanternfly is not a federally regulated pest. A lot of states have set up their own quarantine, so that's why we, uh, for this slide, showing the, in blue the current areas where there is infestation present. The blue areas bordered in red are the states that have set up those state-specific quarantines. Um, other states may be planning to set up quarantine, but it does take some time with legislative process sometimes, or set, you know, just um, the processes in that state to be able to set up a quarantine. But at this point, um, we do not have the federal authority to regulate this pest. So it's extremely important to work with this, uh, with the state, with our cooperators, with industry, so that they're as aware, aware of the pest, aware of um, the potential impact of this pest, and also what, uh, what can be done with it. Um, and right now we are working uh, working on the federal side to slow the spread of spotted lanternfly. We're looking at high risk areas, uh, transportation frameworks, um, and, and looking to utilize as whatever tools available to, to be able to slow that spread because it is expanding. Um, you can see that and probably from any previous talks you may have been on, um, it did start in, in Pennsylvania in 2014 and has expanded to what you see in front of you right now in, in a few years. So with that, um, just a quick, some quick information on what we're planning to do in, in 2021. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, we're moving from hardwoods into conifers, pine, spruce, um, to focus our trapping and surveys in in those areas for 2021 and then of course that will happen in 2022 as well to be able to have coverage um, in, as, in as much of our states as possible so again we'll be using um, similar traps um, some different lures based on these target pests that we'll be looking at in in the pines and the conifers um, and then again, target location similar to what we saw for 2020 and most of our surveys, we're always looking at those high risk areas, our ports, our um, industrial areas, distribution centers, any place that may be receiving solidwood packing material. Ryan talked about that in, our, you know, in the previous talk, that is a pathway. Um, you know, any of that uh, pallets, packing material, it, it can carry pests with it. Uh, and um, some new target pests, uh, Hylobius, Monocomus, uh, Tetropium, and some of those do have specific lures. So we do have, we will be using both um, for 2021. This is just uh, some quick pictures of what our target pests are gonna be in 2021. Um, and we can present on our results. Uh, later on in 2021, we usually get most of those identifications back after the survey season is complete. Uh, and then, of course, as I had mentioned, uh, with one of our finds, we did have this the Xylotrechus find. Uh, we will be focusing efforts uh, on the limitation, uh, setting up some uh, traps in that area of where it was found. It was found in a trap, uh, and we're excited to be able to work again with our um, with the scientists in Otis to be able to use an experimental lure. Uh, that should be able to draw in and hopefully uh, we'll see what we find as well for that survey. Uh, that's planned to happen between May and September of 2021 and it will be concentrated around that initial detection point. And then we're also planning on continuing spotted lanternfly visual survey. We do have again the, um, the population in Connecticut. Very it, At this point it's a low level population we do not have spotted lanternfly in Massachusetts or Rhode Island, so we'll be con continuing the detection 
um, surveys in those in those areas, it's important to know that the uh, preferred host for spotted lanternfly is Ilanthus, a uh, tree of heaven. And so if you are going to be looking for spotted lanternfly at low level population, a good bet is to look at the Ilanthus. So um, just real quick with, uh, so folks are aware, um, apologize if this is duplicate, if you've already seen this through other presentations, uh, but a little bit about the life cycle on spotted lanternfly, um, awareness is, and, and knowing what to look for is so important for early detection. So right now, what you would be seeing basically would be egg masses. Um, the early nymphs will hatch mid-May um, and are out there until late June. And then they turn into the late nymph, the fourth instar where they turn red. Those are mid-June to late July. And then starting mid-July, all the way through to the first really hard freeze, you're gonna be able to see the adults. Um, and that's really when that when we concentrate that visual survey because they, they are the easiest to, to find. Um, so there is at any time during the year, there is a life stage that you could be looking for. Um, egg messes can be anywhere. And I think that's another important thing to point out, uh, not just on trees, not just on tree of Ilanthus, we do find them laying eggs on maple, um, any, any hard surface. So they do have a similar um, tendency like gypsy moth to just lay eggs really anywhere um, and which makes the transport so easy of this pest. And our last poll question. Oh no, I'm sorry, that's the next slide. <laughs> I have two different slides on my screen. Um, and so for the uh, visual survey, as I mentioned, the, the preferred host is Ilanthus, this tree of heaven. So for your folks out there, um, please keep your eye out. It's, you know, you definitely want to key in onto Ilanthus. Um, and that's where, again, you would be looking for that spotted lanternfly. If it's a low level, we're going to see it on Ilanthus. So just a couple of quick photos here of some of the characteristics of Ilanthus um, to be able to, to keep an eye out for. And here's our next poll question. Okay, poll question is up. Thank you. And another friendly reminder for folks to answer this quickly if you were looking for pesticide credit. I also want to point everyone's attention to the chat. Uh, if you've seen some of the messages I've sent, particularly the link to report any suspicious insects that you believe may be the spotted lanternfly in Massachusetts. Thank you, Tani. No problem. So poll question close in 10 seconds. Poll closed. Results, the correct answer was four, 73% got it right. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. And speaking of reporting, um, great great placement of that uh, that info in the chat, Tawny. Um, I'm going back to you know how important early detection is, and part of that is what all of the folks on this um, on this webinar can do. It's reporting pests of concern. If you see something um, that doesn't doesn't look familiar, um, please report it. There, we actually have a great um, a vast majority of ways that you can report. Tawny posted some stuff in the chat. I'm gonna put some stuff up on these slides here. There is a firstdetector.org network, which is more of a national scope. Um, and I just pulled this quick screenshot from their website. Um, and just looking at it right now, one thing I do wanna point out is that 2020 was designated as the International Year of Plant Health, um, and it is continuing into 2021. So um, just so folks are aware, there is some information out there um, highlighting some of the work that's done by not just um, PPQ and the, uh, we're, we're considered the plant protection organization for the United States, but other plant protection organ organizations internationally have recognized this as um, the International Year of Plant Health. So there's a lot of focus on that and, and to keep 
get awareness out there um, of, of the importance of plant health, basically. So just quickly through, uh, wanted to point out in, our, in the three states, there is reporting for the state. Uh, in addition, Pawnee had put out some of the national, um, there's numbers, websites, uh, all sorts of avenues that you can report pests through. This is the Massachusetts one. Tawny has that in the chat as well. Um, if you happen to be in Connecticut, also our uh, state cooperator, the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station um, uh, is always looking for reports in Connecticut. And then in Rhode Island, um, the Department of Environmental Management uh, also has pest reporting sites. And you can see these, these sites that I brought up is with the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program. So there is a CAPS program in, in every state that's partnering with PPQ for these um, pest detection and trapping efforts. And so I can't, I can't close out a talk without bringing up uh, what you can do. And, and that is, you know, it, it was actually brought up in one of the, the questions um, after Ryan's talk is human, we move pests much further than they move themselves often. So one of the things we can do, each and every one of us, is is not move pests unknowingly. And part of that, it, up here in the Northeast, we we talk a lot about not moving firewood um, because firewood can carry pests. Um, you can see there's insects just, that's emerald ash borer in that last picture I just brought up, um, but ALB can be moved through firewood. Um, a lot of these pests that we just talked about and exotics, that's how they can move. And you can move them across states, across an entire country um, just by, you know, not a lot of people just don't don't are not aware of that risk. So if we can increase that awareness, um, we will have done our job. I feel. And also, just again, report, have awareness. Um, this is our uh, Vinvasive is this character here, and this is um, our hungry pest campaign on the PPQ side. There's some really great resources, um, and you don't need this long website. You can just Google it. Um, Google Vinvasive or um, Hungry Pests. There's great resources for classrooms, um, outreach material. If we could have been in person, I would have had lots of those really cool masks you can see our technician wearing there on the photo um, that you could take with you. So um, please be aware of that. If there is any material that folks would like to, um, to have, please reach out to me. I'd be glad to mail some out because I think the public awareness is, is just such a key factor in what we're trying to do um, with early detection of pests. And it is important to highlight a lot of, a lot of the, the first reports of pests are coming from the public, are coming from a concerned citizen calling um, or industry, like Ryan had pointed out for the, um, that Boston find of ALB. That was somebody, you know, that was someone in the industry who had just been trained on, on signs and symptoms and they had called. So, so important. Um, coming up in just a couple months, uh, April is um, is usually is always deemed the Invasive Plant Pest and Disease Awareness Month. So please take that opportunity, take a look at your trees. Uh, one thing with the pandemic we have seen is a lot more people are outside looking at trees, looking at what's going on outdoors. So we there was an increase in reports, which is wonderful, and we're, we're always glad to have that. So uh, we just try to emphasize to continue that moving forward. Um, and I also would like to say too, uh, a, a good time to point out that um, our technician who really did a lot with our pest detection program retired, um, phenomenal uh, and really missing him, but uh, we are going to be able to hire that position. So uh, I'll, just a quick plug for usajobs.gov, that's where you can find um, some of our federal positions. So anyone who's interested in something like this, uh, please check it out. Those will be coming up soon. So, um, and then just, I just want to close it out with bringing that continuum back up. You know, it, uh, you know that the, our detection starts at the ports of entry. If we can find it there, wonderful with our, you know, and again, that's our, our Customs and Border Protection partners. They're constantly intercepting pests um, and taking action on things there at the, at the ports. But then we have our whole, um, response network domestically for pest detection, trapping, reporting, outreach, awareness. And from that, we get, you know, our programs and, and responses that require follow-up. So uh, just a, a reach out to folks on, on this webinar. You are an integral part of that. Um, and just having those eyes and ears in, in the public, in industry, um, it is so important for us to be able to accomplish what we need to accomplish and prevent that establishment 
um, and spread of exotic invasive pests. So that's all I have, um, unless there's some questions. And there's, again, some more reporting, a uh, phone number, website. Again, there's, if you Google it, there's, there's really a lot of avenues to be able to send in reports if you see anything. Great, Kate. Thank you so much. And yes, we have a bunch of questions queued up, so I'll just dive into those. Some comments about how terrifying Vinvasive is, and I would agree. <laughs> um, uh, first question from Kathleen. Uh, was the offshore growing facility that had the Ralstonia Race 3 Biovar 2 shut down? Um, there's some apprehension there about avoiding that facility or their products, I guess. Can you speak to that a little bit? I Absolutely. Yes, it, it was at the time, like, uh, you know, and they were, uh, they were uh, working with USDA, with PPQ to, you know, get to the root, <laughs> no pun intended, get to the root of the problem at the rooting station. Um, so, and uh, there is, there were very rigorous protocols put into place. So yes, it was shut down. Um, the finding, and I don't have all the specifics of of the actual cause, but they they were able to pinpoint what had happened. They were able to um, fix that issue, and so it was closed down until it could go through a much you know through that process again. And it went through a very rigorous review process, um, and it was just recently um, given the okay to operate again. But again, it it will still go through very rigorous protocols, um, you know, coming up. So yes, it. So the short answer is yes, it was shut down until we can pinpoint exactly what had happened and ensure that that um, was, was resolved. Thank you. Another question here from Jan, uh, follow up about the Emerald ash borer regulation changes. Mm -hmm. uh, is that EAB deregulation statewide or national? Na so I, I'm speaking um, from the federal terms. Federally, it was deregulated. The states individually of their own accord may still have regulations for interstate move uh, for interstate movement, um, especially of firewood or of uh, EAB uh, an EAB regulation itself. So that is state specific. Um, Massachusetts does not have an EAB quarantine, um, but like Connecticut has a firewood regulation. So the states may be keeping their EAB regs on the books, but federally we do not, we no longer have the quarantine. Thank you. Um, another question here from Felicia. Are the maps available on the web specifically about uh, the Emerald Ash Borer biocontrol release map that shows the Eastern US? Yes, um, well, so it, it our maps are gonna show the national, um, but I pulled that map right from our, um, the, PP, the APHIS PPQ website under, um, plant pest programs and it's it's one of the maps readily available so you can pull those off. You can also pull like the first county detection maps. There's actually quite a few there um, on our webpage that, that has a lot of information. Thank you. Uh, another question here um, from Kathleen. Are the newly detected velvet longhorn beetles a mutation of the Asian longhorn beetle? Uh, I guess, no. or is this its own species? It's its own species, so it's not a mutation. It's in the same thing. It's a serumbicid, um, but completely different from Asian longhorn beetle, biologically, life cycle, hosts, all of that. Thank you. Uh, I see another reminder in the chat here. Uh, thank you, Ellen, for sharing that. Those of you who want pesticide credit, please remain on. Uh, we're going to try to answer some more questions here, and uh, I will give you instructions for pesticide and association credits shortly. Okay, uh, sorry for that interruption. Kate, um, uh, another question here from Mary. Why was the tree of heaven chosen as a survey plant for spotted lanternfly? Is this a preferred host? Yes, it is. So Tree of Heaven is a preferred host of spotted lanternfly. Um, in the very beginning in 2014, we were find they in Pennsylvania they were finding it mostly on Tree of Heaven. So um, it's just it is a preferred host. So if we're if you don't have population and you're looking for that low level first um, uh, first detection, that's the most likely place to find it. There are other hosts for spotted lanternfly, so it's not just Tree of Heaven but that's its preferred. And they, and then we also feel it might be, there is um, research going on right now, but they do feel Tree of Heaven may be necessary for the uh, completed life cycle of spotted lanternfly, but that's still ongoing research. 
Thank you. Um, another question uh, from Steve. Are there native ambrosia beetles? Um, asking specifically, we had a heavy infestation in 2017 in oaks and had heavy mortality from gypsy moth, but wondering if uh, any native ambrosia beetles increased mortality? So yes, there's definitely native ambrosia beetles. Um, and um, I don't know if I can answer that question specifically about the relation with the natives to mortality. Um, so I know, like you were saying, paired with gypsy moth, um, there's a lot of different things happening in our forest right now. Um, so I, I can add to that too, if you'd thank like. You. <laughs> um, I'll just say I pointed out uh, before answering this live to Steve that in some cases after a, a gypsy moth outbreak, uh, one of our native insects, the two-line chestnut borer, which is not an ambrosia beetle, it's more closely related to, uh, or it is a buprestid, so more closely related to even the emerald ash borer, but the two-line chestnut borer is one that we did see uh, another peak in its activity and, and sort of uh, being a secondary pest following the gypsy moth outbreak. Um, okay, uh, Kate, let's see if I can squeeze in some more questions for you, sure. Kath. Uh, one from Kathleen Marie. Uh, is there any benefit to allowing a single tree of heaven in a town park to remain as an agent uh, for spotted lanternfly monitoring? So that's something they're researching right now. Um, they've taught, you know, trap trees is what I've, you know, <laughs> what it's been referred to in, in some of the studies. So it, you know, and, and yes, you know, you can say that you have, you know, a, a huge stand of Ilanthus. If you were to leave that one, draw all the spotted lantern fly to that one, treat it with a, a pesticide, and then you kill that population of spotted lantern fly. So that's something that they are researching um, to see how um, how beneficial that is. But it's not. We we don't have the the final results on that. But it could especially be. Um, it could be a tool, uh, but again, they're, they're they're looking into it. Thank you. Um, another question from a different Kathleen. Where can we find more information on the 2021 emerging species? Emerging species. I'm uh, so I'm assuming maybe this is the the context of the question is how do we pick the targets and the pests that we're looking for? Uh, we don't necessarily have a list. There's a lot that goes into that. So I'd say um, I can, you know, provide her my information, and we, we'd be glad to, you know, uh, get more detail if we can. But it's it, it's not necessarily a list. So there is information on hungry pests um, about the specific uh, pest programs and you know the the invasives that we're, we're looking at. But I don't know if that really answers the question. But I, I think. I, I think so, going to hungrypest.com, I think they're maybe looking for further information about some of the insects that you talked about. Oh yes, um, if that, yes, absolutely. Hungry Pest is a wealth of information on those. Great, let's see another question slash comments uh, from Kathleen. So what is so shocking to me, and I bet others, is the amount of pests coming into our ports via imported goods and their pallets. Uh, what is being done to more closely inspect these goods coming into our ports on the state and federal level? This is shocking and appalling. So there is a ISPM 15. Um, it's there's international standards on pallets. So there is a requirement, and this was actually uh, a huge a huge thing that went through a number of years ago to actually require those international standards. So uh, like the Likely the ALB um, introduction was before we had those standards in place. And uh, you know some of these pests that we're responding to and that we're dealing with right now were the catalyst to be able to get those standards in place. And so that requires wood, solid wood packing material to be treated before it can be utilized in, in such case. And so um, there are standards, there is a lot of work for that inspection and also when it is found, we call them non-compliant um, wood packing material violations, there is follow through and there is able, you know, there's looking at um, reaching out to the foreign country to make sure they're aware of the issue. And, you know, that that happens with some of our, our trading partners. So um, there are standards in place. 
uh, there is work to ensure that those standards are um, being met and upheld. Thank you. Uh, hopefully time for one more and maybe another. <laughs> um, sure. One from Beverly. Is it possible to get posters about firewood to put up at farm stands and uh, pick your own operations? Yes. So again, if you look at Hungry Pest, there is there is material you can download and print. But if you would like that, please reach out to us or also to, um, I know MDAR, uh, Tawny had put up that site. They have also uh, material that they are, are looking for folks to spread the word. So um, reach out to us. Uh, we do have, I actually have some in my office, eight and a half by 11. Um, but again, also through Hungry Pest, there's a whole list of materials that you can request. So Thank yes, you. please, I, I welcome the assistance. <laughs> Great. Um, let's see another comment. Please note that the tree of heaven is also an invasive in Connecticut. I, it's considered an invasive tree, I believe, in Massachusetts as well. Um, uh, and maybe, Kate, if you want to speak to that, I also want to try to throw in one last question and then we'll have to wrap up with our credit information. Uh, are the EAB biocontrol programs only on state property or can private landowners participate? Okay, so I'll go to the Ilanthus, and yeah, absolutely, it is an invasive. It's found in disturbed areas. So, um, and one of the things we use in our targeting to try and find these areas to both, you know, to set out our detection traps or um, our visual survey. So, um, but we did find spider lantern fly does have other hosts. So the answer isn't to get rid of all Ilanthus because Ilanthus is going to always be around. <laughs> um, but it is an invasive. So, but, but the concern is the other hosts, spotted lantern fly also um, can be a pest on grapes. It can be a pest on hops. So there are, are other, a, a multitude of other um, hosts that it can also be on. So for, and then ju jumping to Emerald Ashboard, did, did that provide enough on that one, Donnie? Yes, and if you okay. could give a quick answer for the EAB question, thank you. Sure, you bet. Uh, biocontrol, yes, yeah, so the, the release programs are currently with our state partners. Um, and there is, I know a number, a few land trusts have worked to get that. Um, there are certain protocols of the site specifics of where we, where you want to carry out that. So there usually is a reach out um, for any interested parties that would be willing to, to partner. So um, I, again, I know it went to Nature Conservancy's land trust. I don't know if it's been um, rolled private citizens yet. So again, I would offer my contact information and I'd be glad to follow through um, additionally on that. But I, I don't know for 2021 if that's going to be happening um, for the public. Well, thank you so much, Kate. Excellent presentation. Thank you for answering so many great questions from the audience. I do uh, want to note from DCR in the comment or question section, they're noting that we are only releasing EAB biocontrol on state land. So uh, comment from our Department of Conservation and Recreation in Massachusetts. But thank you again, Kate. I'm going to 